Hi there. I pray that you will be encouraged by these readings, which are for day number 355. Today we read Haggai 1 and 2, Isaiah 58, and Revelation 12. I hope you saw correlations to Revelation in the third chapter of Zephaniah yesterday, in what God plans for the nations and for those who come to the new Jerusalem. And these verses from that third chapter are interesting because of correlations all over Scripture. I will remove all proud and arrogant people from among you. There will be no more haughtiness on my holy mountain. Those who are left will be the lowly and humble, for it is they who trust in the name of the Lord. Mears gives a helpful summary about the prophets. Of the sixteen prophets, most of them, eleven, prophesied before the exile. Just two prophesied during the exile, Ezekiel and Daniel, while three prophesied after the exile. We turn to the first of those three now, Haggai. This book consists of four prophecies made in four months, each dated and all in the second year of King Darius's reign. In the modern calendar, these dates would have been between August 29 and December 18, 520 B.C. This places Haggai's messages two months before Zechariah started to prophesy. Haggai's purpose was to move a discouraged nation to rise up and build the temple. Remember that opposition to the rebuilding of the temple caused a postponement of the work which caused the discouragement. Haggai 1 On August 29 of the second year of King Darius's reign, the Lord gave a message through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies says. The people are saying, The time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the Lord sent this message through the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? This is what the Lord of heaven's armies says. Look at what's happening to you. You have planted much, but harvest little. You eat, but are not satisfied. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies says. Look at what's happening to you. Now go up into the hills, bring down timber, and rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You hoped for rich harvests, but they were poor. And when you brought your harvests home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins, says the Lord of heaven's armies, while all of you are busy building your own fine houses. It's because of you that the heavens withhold the dew and the earth produces no crops. I have called for a drought on your fields and hills, a drought to wither the grain and grapes and olive trees and all your other crops, a drought to starve you and your livestock and to ruin everything you have worked so hard to get. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of God's people began to obey the message of the Lord their God. When they heard the words of the prophet Haggai, whom the Lord their God had sent, the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave the people this message from the Lord. I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord sparked the enthusiasm of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the enthusiasm of Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the enthusiasm of the whole remnant of God's people. They began to work on the house of their God, the Lord of heaven's armies, on September 21 of the second year of King Darius's reign. Haggai 2 
Then, on October 17 of the same year, the Lord sent another message through the prophet Haggai. Say this to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of God's people there in the land. Does anyone remember this house, this temple, in its former splendor? How, in comparison, does it look to you now? It must seem like nothing at all. But now the Lord says, Be strong, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people still left in the land. And now get to work, for I am with you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. My spirit remains among you, just as I promised when you came out of Egypt. So do not be afraid. For this is what the Lord of heaven's armies says, In just a little while I will again shake the heavens and the earth, the oceans and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and the treasures of all the nations will be brought to this temple. I will fill this place with glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And in this place I will bring peace. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. On December 18 of the second year of King Darius's reign, the Lord sent this message to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies says. Ask the priests this question about the law. If one of you is carrying some meat from a holy sacrifice in his robes, and his robe happens to brush against some bread or stew, wine or olive oil, or any other kind of food, will it also become holy? The priests replied, No. Then Haggai asked, If someone becomes ceremonially unclean by touching a dead person and then touches any of these foods, will the food be defiled? And the priests answered, Yes. Then Haggai responded, That is how it is with this people and this nation, says the Lord. Everything they do and everything they offer is defiled by their sin. Look at what was happening to you before you began to lay the foundation of the Lord's temple. When you hoped for a twenty-bushel crop, you harvested only ten. When you expected to draw fifty gallons from the wine press, you found only twenty. I sent blight and mildew and hail to destroy everything you worked so hard to produce. Even so, you refuse to turn to me, says the Lord. Think about this eighteenth day of December, the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Think carefully. I am giving you a promise now while the seed is still in the barn. You have not yet harvested your grain, and your grapevines, fig trees, pomegranates, and olive trees have not yet produced their crops. But from this day onward I will bless you. On that same day, December 18, the Lord sent this message to Haggai. Tell Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, that I am about to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow royal thrones and destroy the power of foreign kingdoms. I will overturn their chariots and riders. The horses will fall and their riders will kill each other. But when this happens, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will honor you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant. I will make you like a signet ring on my finger, says the Lord, for I have chosen you. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. We turn to Isaiah 58. In Isaiah 57, we saw again that God considers idolatry to be a sin against him that is just like a wife being unfaithful to her husband. In such a context of explicit and harsh condemnation, these words stand out. I have seen what they do, but I will heal them anyway. I will lead them. I will comfort those who mourn, bringing words of praise to their lips. Then God says, 
But those who still reject me are like the restless sea, which is never still, but continually churns up mud and dirt. And finally, for the second time in Isaiah, God says this, There is no peace for the wicked, says my God. Isaiah 58 Shout with the voice of a trumpet blast. Shout aloud, don't be timid. Tell my people Israel of their sins. Yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day and seem delighted to learn all about me. They act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God. They ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending that they want to be near me. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have been very hard on ourselves, and you didn't even notice. I will tell you why, I respond. It's because you are fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourself with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? No, this is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. Then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward, and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then when you call, the Lord will answer, Yes, I am here. He will quickly reply. Remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness, and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry, and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. Some of you will rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities. Then you will be known as the rebuilder of walls and the restorer of homes. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Don't pursue your own interests on that day, but enjoy the Sabbath and speak of it with delight as the Lord's holy day. Honor the Sabbath in everything you do on that day and don't follow your own desires or talk idly. Then the Lord will be your delight. I will give you great honor and satisfy you with the inheritance I promised to your ancestor Jacob. I, the Lord, have spoken. We turn now to Revelation 12. In Revelation 11, John again took an active part in the vision he was seeing. He was given a rod and told to measure the temple, the altar, and count the worshippers. What other prophet participated in measuring a temple in a vision? Do you remember? John was told not to measure the court of the Gentiles. I encourage you to dig for gold there. Check out some online study Bibles on this, and while you're at it, Find out what ideas people have about the two witnesses. John is not the first prophet that saw olive trees on both sides of a lamp and lampstand. Who was that other prophet? And how is John's vision different than that other prophet's vision? At the end of the chapter, we heard the last trumpet. Say... That sounds familiar. Is that the last trumpet that Paul mentions? 
The words of praise by the 24 elders and the last verse in the chapter give a big clue as to what the seventh trumpet brings. What happens in the next two chapters, the first of which we read now, is not the direct result of that trumpet blast. If you want to dig for any of those things, I've put a new page at dailybiblereading.info, and it's called Shovels. Revelation 12. Then I witnessed in heaven an event of great significance. I saw a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon beneath her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant, and she cried out because of her labor pains and the agony of giving birth. Then I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and ten horns with seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept away one-third of the stars in the sky, and he threw them to the earth. He stood in front of the woman as she was about to give birth, ready to devour her baby as soon as it was born. She gave birth to a son who was to rule all nations with an iron rod, and her child was snatched away from the dragon and was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where God had prepared a place to care for her for 1,260 days. Then there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels, and the dragon lost the battle, and he and his angels were forced out of heaven. The great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. It has come at last, salvation and power, and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. And they, our brothers and sisters, have defeated them by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who live in the heavens, rejoice. But terror will come on the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you in great anger, knowing that he has little time. When the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But she was given two wings like those of a great eagle, so she could fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness. There she would be cared for and protected from the dragon for a time, times, and half a time. Then the dragon tried to drown the woman with a flood of water that flowed from his mouth. But the earth helped her by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that gushed out from the mouth of the dragon. And the dragon was angry at the woman and declared war against the rest of her children, all who keep God's commandments and maintain their testimony for Jesus. Then the dragon took his stand on the shore beside the sea. Let's pray together. Dear Sovereign Lord, our God, our Creator, our Savior, we see the reason for the spiritual battle that is in the world today. Satan is angry and he realizes that he has but a little time. He is making war against us with all the power that he has and with all the forces at his disposal 
including all those disobedient angels that were thrown down with him. The testimony of the brothers and sisters in this chapter is that they defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Let that be our testimony, Lord. Let us be fearless and bold, and let us remember that we have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. You, Lord, in Isaiah 58, speak about the Sabbath day, how we are to love the day that is set apart for you, and to speak of it as a delight, as the Lord's day. How good it would be, Lord, if we followed these directions and didn't follow our desires or even talk idly on that day. And thank you for the promises that are given to those who have compassion on people who have needs, who help to release the chains of people in bondage, who give shelter to the homeless, who give food to the hungry who help their relatives in need. You say, your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward. And the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then when you call, the Lord will answer, yes, I am here. He will quickly reply, oh, Oh, Lord, we would like that. We would like you to be with us today. We would like the glory of the Lord to protect us from behind as we go forward.